You're listening to the Fed and Fearless podcast. On today's episode, I'm chatting with registered dietitian Anna Bonangle about why your healthy diet may not be enough to help you get pregnant. So stay tuned. Welcome to the Fed and Fearless podcast. I'm your host, Laura Schoenfeld, a registered dietitian, nutrition business coach, and online entrepreneur with over 10 years of experience in online business. And I'm here to show you everything I've learned about creating a life and a business that nourishes you. On this podcast, we'll talk about the lifestyle habits, practical strategies, mindset shifts, and leaps of faith required to build a healthy body, a powerful mind, a strong spirit, and a successful business. Hello, and welcome back to the Fed and Fearless podcast. I'm Laura Schoenfeld, and on today's episode, we're going deep on fertility. And as a lot of you know by now, I myself am pregnant. By the time this episode comes out, I believe I'll be about 21 weeks, which is kind of crazy to think about, but it's something that has been on my mind extra lately because of my pregnancy. And then also it's something that I worked with a lot of clients on improving and, you know, helping them get pregnant. And so I have a lot of passion for this topic and so does my guest today. And that's why I was so excited to have her on. So today's guest is Anna Bonangle. After earning her MS in nutrition science and policy at Tufts University, she trained in clinical research and medical nutrition therapy at the National Institutes of Health Clinical Center. Anna kissed the East Coast goodbye and moved to Portland, Oregon to accept a position at OHSU to develop and manage wellness programs for the researchers, healthcare providers, and educators of the Academic Medical Center. Her passion for prenatal health was born with the opportunity to develop a curriculum for the pregnancy exercise and nutrition program. In 2015, she started her first private practice, helping women to feel their best through good food. Since then, she has dove even deeper into women's functional medicine and what it takes to be a healthy mom growing a healthy family. The preconception period is a uniquely powerful time when you have the most influence over the health and well-being for generations to come. So that's where Anna focuses, helping women achieve optimal health now as a prerequisite to a healthy pregnancy, a manageable postpartum, and having the energy to enjoy motherhood. Her life's work is teaching women like you how to nourish yourself to truly feel good so you can grow the family of your dreams with energy, confidence, and joy. So Anna is a member and alumni of my Nutrition Business Accelerator program. So that's how we formally met each other. And as I mentioned, she is just as passionate, if not more passionate than me, about fertility and helping women get pregnant more easily and have a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby. So we had a lot to talk about on this episode today, and I want to get right into it. So without further ado, here is Anna Bonangle. All right, everybody. Well, I am so excited to have with us on the show today, Anna Bonangle. Welcome to the Fed and Fearless podcast, Anna. Thanks, Laura. I've followed you for so many years. It's such an honor to be here. Oh, well, I'm so happy that you're here and I'm excited to chat about fertility today. This is something that um, I had definitely been thinking about a lot in the last couple of years just to make sure I was appropriately planning and taking care of my body so that when the time came, it would be easier to get pregnant. And as some people may know from my update episode, it literally took like three weeks after we started trying <laughs> to get pregnant. So first time it uh, went right away. And and I know that's not everybody's experience, so I'm not saying that to be um, flippant. But what I will say is I did spend you know, at least a year preparing for it and being consistent with nutrition and supplementation and healthy lifestyle and all of that. So, um, and my husband, he's, you know, he's not quite as neurotic as I am about health, but, you know, he was taking care of his uh, health needs as well. So I strongly believe that part of what allowed me to get pregnant that fast is that I didn't wait until I wanted to get pregnant to actually start preparing Either way, if somebody's struggling with fertility or they know they want to get pregnant and they just want to make sure that they give themselves the best shot possible, I know that our conversation today is going to be really important for them. So before we get 
started with the conversation around what to do and what not to do, I would love for you to share your story with our audience and just um, tell us about how you became a nutritionist focused specifically on fertility. Yeah. Okay. I would love to. And I'll just pause really quickly and just say kudos to you, Laura, for spending a year preparing your body for pregnancy. I think that you're story is kind of exceptional. A lot of people don't think about it until they're actually like removing the birth control. And so I think you get a lot of credit for the fact that like you got pregnant so quickly. I think it's just because I'm a control freak, but I'll take the compliment. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you take good care of yourself. So kudos. So how I got interested in this. So I have always been focused on women's health. That's always been my primary passion. I started my private practice seven, eight years ago now, focused specifically on women's health. And at that time, I was really focused on reframing the conversation around nutrition and health from like, you know, I knew a lot of people doing beach body stuff. And I was like, you know, I really want health and nutrition to be about feeling good. But I found very quickly that the women that were coming to me were in some sort of life stage where they were going through something that they needed guidance on. And that typically was either pregnancy or menopause. And since I was in the baby making years myself, it just became a really natural segue to just focus on the baby making years. And so initially I focused on fertility, pregnancy, and postpartum. I really loved that work, carrying women through the journey. But what I found was the most rewarding was like helping somebody like get pregnant to begin with. And it's just like the most heartwarming, amazing experience to have somebody be like, oh my gosh, I'm pregnant. Thank you. So, and then I took your course, Laura, and I was like, okay, I really need to niche down. So I'm going to choose this part that fills my heart the most and not to make this too long winded, but I also take a broader public health perspective. And I know that if you can treat your body really well in the preconception period, that that has multi-generational benefits. So I also know that working on fertility and preconception is the time from a health perspective when I could have the greatest impact for generations to come. So here I am. Yeah, I love it. And I don't know if a lot of people know this because I don't think I necessarily have talked about it. I might have. I, I feel like I did an episode on the decision to transition to business coaching. But right before that happened, I was actually planning on completely I don't say starting from scratch with my business. I don't actually believe that you ever start from scratch. I think you're always building momentum, even if it's just using the skills that you've learned. But back in January of 2020, I had actually met with my coach at the time and had planned out a total like rebranding of my business to focus on fertility. Because just like you, I helping women get pregnant was something that was so rewarding. And it was really a cool outcome to help people with. Um, Because there's so many different health issues you can work on. And Some of them, in my personal opinion, are more joyful than others. Mm -hmm, (laughs) And so being mm -hmm. able to help somebody get pregnant and then knowing that this human now exists in the world and you had a a small role to play in that baby being born is just something that's super exciting. So I can totally empathize with your choice. And I think it's great because unfortunately, it is something that I think is really necessary right now, especially what you were saying about, you know, the generational impacts of, of nutrition on people's health for generations. I don't know if we're always thinking that far ahead, but it is something that makes such a big difference. And I know for me personally, you know, again, I'll never know this is not a controlled experience experiment, but I do think that beyond just getting pregnant more easily. And part of that was also fertility tracking. Like that was something that I was paying attention to for pretty much the last six years, I think is when I was really doing that consistently. So I was very confident that I would be assuming everything was good with my husband, that it would be relatively fast to get pregnant because of, you know, just that information. But, um, something that I feel like I wasn't thinking about that I'm glad I prepared for even, uh, subconsciously is, not really being able to eat or take supplements during that first trimester. And at first it was a little stressful for me because I was like, I don't want my baby to be like struggling to develop its organs or its brain or something because I'm hardly eating anything and I, I, uh, I can't take my supplements that I want to take. I still took, uh, 
some gummy ones, which they were okay as far as quality is concerned. They were like the top quality gummy ones, but I knew that that wasn't what I wanted to be taking. Um, But I do think, you know, knowing what I know and doing some research about it during that period of time, all of the work I did to prepare for the pregnancy made it very likely that those couple of months where I couldn't eat much, I was eating a lot of like processed food and not really taking a lot of supplementation because of nausea. I feel like my body was able to handle it because of all the prep work I had done. So I feel like our conversation today is definitely going to center around the process of getting pregnant. But something I want to, you know, from personal experience emphasize here is that even if you're not thinking you're going to struggle to get pregnant or, you know, nobody ever knows, obviously, but even if you're pretty confident, you'll be able to because you don't have any sign of hormone issues. Um, I do think that you never know how you're going to react to being pregnant. And the more you can do to have your body in a good state before you get pregnant, the better you'll be throughout the pregnancy. Because even if you're feeling like garbage, like I was, you at least know, hey, I have some stored nutrients here that I can pull from. And it's not just like totally depleting me as I'm eating like chicken nuggets and applesauce for yeah. three months. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You make some really good points. You know, most of the women that I work with are trying pretty hard to get pregnant, but the reality, the statistic is something like 50% of pregnancies are unplanned, right? So if you're in your reproductive years, so 16 to 56, you really should be, you know, and ultimately like good fertility is taking good care of yourself. So giving your body the nutrients it needs because you you never really know. And you make such a good point about that first trimester. So, you know, the neural tube forms and begins formation in those first four weeks. That's before most people even realize that they're pregnant. And so that's why some of the nutrients like folate and choline, there's such a big emphasis on taking that before you're trying to get pregnant. So you have all of those nutrients on board, ready to go. Well, that makes me feel a little better because I've been relatively averse to eggs. <laughs> and normally I was eating eggs almost every single day. And I actually didn't know that the neural tube formed in that first four weeks. So now that now I'm a little bit less worried about my, I mean, I'm still going to work on getting my choline in. I'm not going to just be like, I don't need choline now. But that was one thing I was a little stressed about in the last couple of weeks. Like, okay, now that my my food aversions are not awful I got to start eating eggs again. And it was like, ooh, for some reason, these are still not attractive to me. So I'll still try to get them in though. I know they're good for you. But but. even if you are an egg eater, it's really hard to get enough choline. And yes, you need choline for the neural tube development in those first four weeks. But the research that's coming out is so interesting about choline and you really need it throughout pregnancy. And it's being linked to like improved cognitive function, but particularly improved memory, like until like teenagehood and your baby. So eat eggs if you can, but eat, like, so one egg yolk is like about 125 milligrams of choline. Sorry if this is getting too detailed and nerdy. No, but I'm, you need, I'm all for it. <laughs> okay. You need at least like 450 and some practitioners that I follow will recommend up to 900 milligrams. Wow. So if you eat, you know, two eggs, that's only at 250. That's still only about half the dose. So Mm -hmm. I recommend supplementing and eating eggs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, Anna. Now I'm going to have to start (laughs) eating eggs again. (laughs) I don't, I mean, I never recommend eating something that makes you feel sick, right? Like I Mm -hmm. do believe first and foremost, food should be enjoyable. So, you know, when I was pregnant, I remember like trying to force myself to eat salmon and it made me feel so sick and I knew it was the best food, but then I ended up having like an aversion to salmon and I was like, I should have just, you know, yeah, force myself to eat that. (laughs) Yeah. There's a lot of foods that I used to eat a lot of that are uh, not the most attractive to me right now. So, and it doesn't make me sick. I would just say, I don't know. It's like, I almost feel like I've developed some like just neurological versions because stuff used to make me feel sick. So now it's like, oh, I'm not really into it, but I can do it. I can handle it. Uh, <laughs> hard, hard, hard boiled eggs seem to be okay. Cause they're not as like, they don't smell like anything. And anyway, you guys don't have to know all about my food habits, but it is, <laughs> it is very, it is very uh, time sensitive for me. Cause it is something that, like I said, I used to eat eggs almost, almost every day. And sometimes three eggs, like that was relatively common for me to have three and not just two. So So all of that said, you know, I think I'm probably not a typical person when it comes to food choices. I always forget that sometimes when I see what other people think is healthy and I'm like, oh, okay. So on that note, I know that there's a lot of women out there who, 
in their minds, they consider themselves a healthy eater, but then when it comes to getting pregnant, they struggle. And so why do you think that is? Is there something that they're missing or is there like, you know, are they just totally off track with what they consider to be eating healthy? What's, what's going on there? Yeah, good question. And I, just to like pause there for a second, I don't think that, you know, even though this is my specialty, that nutrition fixes all fertility issues, not at all. But the research is very clear that nutrition can have a huge impact. And that's part of why I love this work. And so a lot of times when women come to me and they're quote unquote eating healthy, some of the things that I see are one, just in general, not eating enough. I think that we have a society that equates skinny with healthy and they really can't, they really aren't one in the same. They're two different things. And that your body needs to have the assurance that it's going to have enough food on board to make another human before you can be fertile. So that's like the first step that I run through with women is like looking at their overall food intake and making sure they're eating enough. I also see, honestly, like a lot of women who come to me, probably similar to your audience are very health focused. And then that can very easily slip into like perfectionism. And I do as much as I'm like, yes, you need to eat eggs and you need to eat all the good food. I also think it's a slippery slope of getting too perfectionist about it. And when you're struggling to get pregnant, that's the most stressful thing ever. And so stressing yourself out about eating perfectly, I think also doesn't serve you. So finding that sweet spot of like giving your body the nutrition and the real food you need without making yourself a crazy person about being really neurotic and perfectionist about it. And then of course, I also see a lot of like extremes, like people thinking they need to be hundred percent plant-based or hundred percent vegan or the opposite end of the street extremes where they're like cutting out carbs and like going almost all paleo. And the approach that I take is a very balanced approach, like you know, research-based, you know, a, a little bit of everything, unless you have an intolerance to it. So like a healthy balance of protein, vegetables, carbs, all of it, and not going to extreme cutting out food groups. I just have one more that <laughs> if I'm not going off too long, but one thing that I'm seeing a lot of lately is, um, there's a lot of sexy marketing out there for prenatal supplements, like on Instagram and other social media. And so I've had a lot of women coming to me, taking these really well-marketed supplements that look really beautiful and seem really convenient. But um, I actually had like the privilege of being able to work with you know, a supplement company and on the process of um, creating their prenatal. And I was really like dismayed at the corners that they were willing to cut. and. Most of the prenatals that I'm seeing advertised on Instagram that come in really beautiful packaging really don't cut it in terms of what's included in there. So that's like the number one thing, like in the first session I have with people that women are coming to me and they're taking a prenatal supplement that doesn't, doesn't provide everything that they need. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, when I was working with women with fertility issues and amenorrhea and that kind of thing, that was a lot of what we were looking at too is total calorie intake, macro balance. I remember, I forget the exact number, but I think, and, and this is a conver- based on a conversation and some research I did with um, Dr. Lara Bryden, who a lot of the audience is probably familiar with. Apparently the ovaries need, I think they need access to a minimum of 140 grams of glucose or carbohydrate every day to support ovulation or ovulatory function. And of course, our body can produce glucose, right? So I'm not saying you absolutely have to eat that to ovulate. I'm sure there's people out there that don't eat that much and they do continue to ovulate. But there's a lot of different reasons why somebody who's eating less than that maybe would not produce enough. And also, if you're super active, you're burning through a lot of it. So this is like the ovaries need to have access to that. It's not just like, oh, you eat 140 grams of carbs and you go do a CrossFit workout for an hour and half of that was burned by your muscles. So I feel like a lot of women didn't really understand how the macros would affect their actual ovulatory function. And that's one reason I really liked the fertility awareness stuff is because you really, I mean, you can't guarantee it. Like it's not like you're in there with a, you know, laparoscopic, you know, camera looking at your ovary actually producing an egg. But when you learn the signs of ovulation and you can actually track those, 
it's you're a lot more confident that the ovulation is actually happening. And I know for me, I used to struggle with like not an eating disorder, but definitely like that orthorexic type of tendency, you know, a good 10 years ago. And my periods would be super irregular. I wasn't tracking anything at that point. So, you know, if you have a 60 day cycle, the likelihood that you're ovulating is pretty low. And I, at least when I was working with fertility clients, a lot of them were having that kind of you know, lack of ovulatory signs, but they maybe were still getting their periods. So they didn't realize that they weren't ovulating. And so I just remember that being really important information that I would share with my my clients and then also my students in my Get Your Period Back program, because a lot of them didn't realize why they needed to increase their carbs so substantially to actually allow their ovaries to function. So, you know, those extreme diets, like the super plant-based diets that are there's several nutrients that I know that you know <laughs> are missing in adequate yeah. quantities. And then the the more like on my end, I was more like paleo and low carb and, you know, grains are bad and all of that. And so that I think could have caused me problems with my fertility had I continued on that path before I was getting pregnant. So I just want to emphasize that because you know, it is something where most of the clients I would work with were very health conscious. And I know most of you listening or you would consider yourself health conscious. And I think it's really easy to believe you're doing something that's healthy because the particular, you know, collection of experts that you follow says it is, but then I hate to say it, but the proof is in the pudding, right? Like if you're, if you're tracking ovulatory signs and symptoms and you're not even seeing those, then it's, probably because you're not ovulating. And if you're not ovulating, it's not going to be very easy to get pregnant. So so anyway, as I said, before we started recording, I can mm. talk about this stuff a lot. <laughs> so yeah, I yeah. want to let you talk, but, <laughs> um, but it is something where I think it's not just people that are eating Chick-fil-A every day or something, right? Like I think sometimes women who consider themselves health conscious assume their diet has nothing to do with it because they are like, well, I eat so healthy. How could that possibly be related to my, my fertility challenges. Right. And, you know, as you were saying also before the, we started the call that it just unfortunately isn't quite that simple, that quote unquote healthy eating, right. It's not just about eating more fruits and vegetables. A lot of like my guru, a lot of, I've learned a lot of this from Lily Nichols, who wrote uh, real food for pregnancy and real food for gestational diabetes. And I love the way she talks about reverse engineering your nutrient needs for fertility and pregnancy. And that when you do, when you look at the nutrients that you need the most of, and then you look at the foods that provide those nutrients in the greatest density, it's almost always animal foods that we don't really eat a lot of. You know, first and foremost, is liver is one of the most nutrient dense foods. And, you know, I, any spectrum of the healthy eating from plant based to paleo, I don't know anybody who's eating a lot of liver, right? So it's hard to get all of the nutrients that you need. You know, and 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 as somebody who follows like the real food philosophy and real food approach, I do really like to take a food first approach. But as I've alluded to several times already, I think fertility and pregnancy is one of those times when supplementation just really is necessary because it's so hard to get everything you need from food alone that you need to produce another human. And it's so nice to have that like insurance on board, right? For the times when you're do get pregnant and you're too nauseous to actually eat food and you're like, it's good to know you've, you've built that up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what would you say to somebody who asks, you know, if, if, if supplementation was so necessary for fertility, then how were humans getting pregnant for, you know, thousands of years before supplements were created? Do you have a thought about like, what would what would be the reason why we need supplements now as opposed to, you know, 500 years ago? Yeah. I have a lot of thoughts about that. <laughs> One is like, you know, we have higher, you know, you know, we're much able to track pregnancy at a much earlier stage now than you were 500 years ago. So there's no way to say that like, there's more miscarriages now than there was 500 years ago. So I guess I'm just saying 500 years ago, I don't know that we need to put that on the halo of health as though we don't know that they weren't having fertility issues then. First, second of all, I mean, you know, you used to be the ancestral RD, right? Like the ancestral diet was based on much more nutrient dense foods. A lot of organ meats like liver would, you know, people used to eat the whole animal and with eating the whole animal, you get the full suite of nutrients that we don't get now. 
also the the soil quality now is really different than it was five year hundred years ago with monoculture agriculture you know, we have depleted a lot of natural nutrients in the soil and we have to add it back in with synthetic fertilizers. And as a result, there is research showing that there is less nutritive value in our crops and in our food now than we were once getting. So I think, you know, I think it's a very multifactorial issue. And, oh, and one more that I should add on there is that we have environmental toxins now that we're exposed to that are absolutely affecting fertility that we didn't have a hundred years ago, much less 500 years ago. So like all of the chemicals in our plastics, the pesticides in our food, the glyphosate on Roundup products, I mean, all of that is affecting our reproductive health. So we've got a lot um, of challenges that they didn't have 500 years ago. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you would add to that list? (laughs) I think the only thing that I've thought about and you know, this is, I'm sure somebody will be like, that's not scientifically accurate, but I've, I've learned this from, um, I used to work with Paul Jaminet, who is the author of The Perfect Health Diet, and one of his theories about why people in our society overeat is because they have to eat enough total food to get their basic nutrient needs met because the food is so nutrient poor. So if it's like, you know, you have the amount of nutrients in a thousand calories when it was a thousand years ago now takes 2000 calories to get those same nutrients. Then you have to eat more total food to get those. And I wonder, I would think it would make sense because of our lifestyle change that we would have needed a lot more calories back when everything was manual, right? Like we didn't have cars, we didn't have washing machines, we didn't have like, you know, microwaves, that kind of thing. So I would imagine that humans had to eat a lot more total calories to get what their energy needs were for the day because they were so active. And if you're just eating more food, you're going to get more nutrients, especially if it's nutrient dense foods, right? So I think unfortunately, you know, I guess it is what it is, but because our lifestyles tend to be relatively sedentary and our calorie needs are not as high as they used to be, it's you're naturally going to reduce your nutrient intake if you're going from like needing 3000 calories a day down to 2000 calories a day. Yeah, that's an interesting. That's, that's a, it's a theory, but like I said that was Paul's one of Paul's theories as to why people were always, you know, more hungry these days because their foods it's like a micronutrient hunger that drives people to mm-hmm. seek out more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm forgetting the term of it, but the, it's like the paradox of the obesity paradox, right? Where we're eating too many calories, but not enough nutrients. So it drives mm-hmm. our hunger. It makes sense mm-hmm. to me. Yeah. So um, as far as I'm like, I, I'm debating how spicy I want to get with the supplements thing, because I definitely know what you're talking about with certain things being advertised. I get I get all the pregnancy ads now. As soon as I started Googling stuff about pregnancy, it was like onslaught of all right, of these ads right. about pregnancy. And I know for, I don't remember what company this is, and I don't necessarily need to call out companies, but I remember there was a company I saw advertising talking about, like they were showing this woman and she was like, follow me in a day of eating for my IVF like journey. And it was a company that sells like pre-prepared like shake mixes, not shakes, like not like the, you know, dry powder shake, but like a pour it into your blender and blend it all up kind of thing. And, oh, here's our soup and here's our salad. And all of it was plant-based. So, and, uh, you know, I I don't think we have too many plant-based listeners on this show. I feel like I've weeded them out over the last 10 years of (laughs) content creation. But I saw that and I was like, man, if somebody was going through IVF and they think like, oh, my doctor said I should be eating healthier, more fruits and vegetables. So I'm going to like buy this like $100 a day plant-based like prepared food service because I want to get all these, you know, plants into my diet. I was like, that's like not helpful. I mean, yeah, maybe it's better than getting zero plants, but I was kind of surprised that that was being advertised as like an IVF supportive diet. I mean, I guess I shouldn't be that surprised. So there's stuff like that. And then as far as the supplements go, I feel like the one I always see advertised with influencers and that kind of stuff is the product called Ritual. That's the one that's like all over the place. And I'm not saying this to be like calling them out or something, but when I've looked into what's in that product... I think they base it on what like the general public health consensus is on the nutrients that women need more of, which is fine. It's better than nothing. But I remember 
just as an example, that there was zero vitamin A in it at all. And I guess there's this belief in the conventional health world that women get plenty of vitamin A and you don't need to worry about vitamin A. And, you know, as I'm not sure if you know this, but my mom's a a nutrition, a dietitian for like, she focuses on fertility and pregnancy as well. And um, yes, I've learned a lot from her, but like she, she's convinced that most women are vitamin A deficient at this point. And I just thought that was interesting because again, I'm not trying to like throw that company under the bus or something, but I would never recommend that if somebody is trying to get pregnant or wants to take it during pregnancy. Cause it's like the likelihood that somebody's getting enough vitamin preformed, easily absorbed vitamin A in their diet is relatively low. And we, we know, you and I know, and hopefully a lot of our listeners know that vitamin A is so crucial for cellular rep- replication and ovulation and all of this stuff. So is that kind of what you're thinking about when you're saying like these popular uh, companies that have really good marketing for pregnant women on, on Instagram and they're, they're promoting these products that are, again, better than nothing. It's better to get you know, ritual than zero prenatal, but I certainly, I guess you probably agree with me that it's not the ideal choice for someone who wants to meet their needs during pregnancy. Yeah, that, that is definitely one of the examples that I had in mind. Um, and I was telling you before we started recording that I've got a, like a three-step checklist to how to choose the best prenatal. And that ritual is one of the ones that I called out in that and gave a side-by-side comparison of some of the nutrients. And you know, just nerd out for a second, vitamin A, I think is really confusing to people because there is the, you know, preformed vitamin A, and then there's the precursors, right? So the beta carotenes that you do absolutely also need, but are easier to get from the food sources. And it's the preformed, the retinol forms that, you know, are harder to get from food alone, right? The best source is going to be liver again, which we're not going to eat. You can get it. This podcast is sponsored <laughs> by the liver industry, just FYI. <laughs> I don't even eat liver, you know? So, but that's partially why I'm like a big proponent of taking some supplements to my food. Cause I'm like, I can't stand liver, right? So I know I need, I take cod liver oil that I can stand. Most of the women who come to me their OBGYN doesn't even glance at their prenatal, much less talk to them about the fact about how a nutrient like vitamin A is essential for fertility, right? And if you've got the genetic SNP or, you know, if you're not getting enough dietarily, they would never put that into the equation of why you might not be getting pregnant. You know, so it's important to look at that full picture because vitamin A is just one example, right? We would also need to evaluate your vitamin E, your vitamin D, the B vitamins, you know, the balance of macronutrients I could go on. Yeah, which I feel like vitamin D is kind of the like golden child of the supplement industry right now and mm-hmm. everybody like I don't I don't think I've ever seen a prenatal that didn't have vitamin D in it. No whether it's enough vitamin D is, you know, TBD on that, right? But um I feel like people are very comfortable with the idea of supplementing with vitamin D, but there's actually like legit fear about vitamin A and like, oh no, you're going to get a birth defect in your baby if you supplement with any sort of vitamin A or eat liver or anything. And as I know, you know, that's total, unless you're eating like a pound of liver a day, that's very difficult to do. Right. So, I mean, in this, it, this is where it stems from is there was a study where they gave extremely intense high doses of synthetic vitamin A to, I'm sorry if it was rats or mice, but it was a rodent. And they gave like just absurdly high quantities. And yes, it did result in birth defects, but just because there's a level, the way I explain this to clients is just because there's a level that's too much doesn't mean you don't need any, you still have to make sure you get enough. And same with vitamin D, there's absolutely a level that is too much. Um, More isn't always better. Yeah. Well, and as I've learned from Chris Masterjohn over the last year, uh, like years, a decade, probably that I've (laughs) been in, in that world, um, the synergy between those two nutrients makes a huge impact too. So the toxicity of either is influenced by the other one, right? So if you're doing a ton of vitamin D without any vitamin A or vice versa, that's going to make it a lot more problematic than if they're balanced. So unfortunately, again, this for whatever reason is completely not common knowledge with the conventional medical space, the conventional fertility space. And even with the companies that are making products for women, the ones that are being recommended or the ones that they sell on the shelf, it's really not actually evidence-based as far as like what is 
appropriate for people. That was one thing I was surprised about. And you might not, <laughs> you, this could be one of the ones on your, your prenatal guide that you're like, eh, not the best, but I actually was pretty impressed. The Smarty Pants Organic Gummies, they do have vitamin A in it. And they actually had a couple of, like they had a very minuscule amount of like choline and K2 and that kind of thing. But for being a gummy, I was like, this isn't too bad. Cause that was like, when I was saying I, I was taking a gummy because I was like, I literally can't stomach pills right now, so I'm going to just do what I need to do. And so that was the one that I found that was like, okay, this is probably better than nothing. But I was honestly surprised that they had the preformed vitamin A, K2, and all of those I mean, small small amounts. But usually I'm used to seeing nothing, right? Yeah. So I don't know if they're one of the ones that you're like, eh, maybe not the best on your no, guide. And- my ch- my like free guide doesn't go through all of the supplements out there. It's really just like a quick checklist of like how to make sure you are getting a good one. But on that note, if there is somebody else who's struggling, you know, because it is hard sometimes, even if you're not pregnant yet, to take big capsules. I have no affiliation with them, but Seeking Health makes a powdered based prenatal that I really like that you can add into like a smoothie. It makes it a lot easier to take. Yeah. I was experimenting and I still have this product. I kind of go back and forth with it. But um, the needed prenatal that they have the powdered version, I was taking that some, but unfortunately even that, if I, if depending on the time of day, it was like a huge experiment to figure out when I could take these supplements. But um, if I put that into a smoothie and made it a pretty substantial smoothie, I could potentially tolerate it in the first trimester. So I was trying to like mix that up a little bit, not just do the gummies, but certain days when I was the most nauseous, I was like, all right, I just got to, the gummy was like totally tolerable. So I think the reason the gummy was more tolerable is because it was quite a lot lower in the minerals, which unfortunately the mm-hmm. minerals are mm-hmm. the ones that at least for me tend to cause the nausea the most, but. Oh, interesting. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Whereas things like needed full circle or wait, no full well is the new name of um, ALS company. And then the seeking health ones, those were the ones I was more consistent with before getting pregnant. They were kind of like my rotation, just depending on which ones were available. Cause I know seeking health was very hard to find for a while and might still be hard to find for some reason. Um, it was back ordered on full script. Yeah. Well, it was back ordered from their website too, I think. Oh, okay. So um, which is why I ended up trying out the, well, also Ayla sent me some of the full well one, which um, I really like that as a, you know, dosage amount. And then this, um, the needed one was another one that I had gotten a sample of, and that one looked pretty good too, at least in my, in my opinion. So I was taking those before I got pregnant. And then, like I said, the few, like two months that I was the most nauseous, it was like, if I could take it, I would try to, or maybe take like half a dose or something of it and then finish with the gummies. So, um, but I do think it's, you know, with the prenatal thing, especially leading up to pregnancy, as you mentioned before, a lot of women aren't even doing that leading up to pregnancy. Like they're like, they find out, and I found out super because of the fertility awareness stuff. I knew at four and a half weeks that I was pregnant, which is like probably about as fast as you can figure it out. I think it was like day 34 of my cycle or something. And I, I figured out I was pregnant. So that wasn't even technically like a missed period. It was like my little Daisy monitor was like doing the rainbow circles. I was like, Oh dear. Okay. (laughs) So, but if you think about it, like, and that's, that's about as early as you can really know that you're pregnant at that point. And I don't know how I didn't know this seems a little silly that I didn't, but I didn't realize that they count the beginning of pregnancy from the first day of your last period. So by the time you even find out that you're pregnant, you're already like five weeks in and you're like, oh crap, I had wine at that concert two weeks ago. And you're just like, what was I doing for the last month? So I feel like if you're waiting until you figure out that you're pregnant to start a prenatal, I'm not saying it's too late. Obviously our bodies are quite miraculous and can do a lot of stuff with limited resources. But, you know, for optimal outcomes, I feel like you got to be starting at least a few months before you're, you're attempting is, is that what's your perspective on that? Like how, how far out do you recommend women really start taking it seriously when it comes to doing things like a prenatal? I mean, if I could like cherry pick, you know, I would get women starting to prepare for pregnancy like a year in advance. That would be amazing. But six months, I also think is plenty of time. It takes 90 days, right, for an ova, the egg cell to develop in your ovary and prepare for ovulation. So like the 90 days pre is like a really key window, but I like 
you know, six months is ideal to replete all of your nutrients. And, you know, one thing we've been talking a lot about nutrients, but I think it's really important to also consider it's not just what you take in, but it's also your gastrointestinal health, like your ability to absorb these nutrients. And so, you know, if you've got constipation or diarrhea or both, or even just bloating and gas can be indicative of some kind of dysbiosis, right? So, That also can take three to six months to get your GI health in an optimal place so that you're absorbing all these nutrients and not just pooping out these expensive vitamins. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I think I think that was a really important point you made about the nutrient repletion process because if you wait and even if you wait until the three month before that ovulatory cycle that ends up being the conception cycle the hope is that you would be just maintaining good nutrient status for that three months, right? It wouldn't be like fixing deficiencies over those three months because by that point, it's possibly a little bit like, and I don't want to say too late in the sense like, again, my hope is that people know I'm not saying that you can't get pregnant or your baby's going to be totally screwed if you don't do this stuff, but education and awareness and, you know, being able to jump on this stuff now, if you can, even if it's your second child or your third child, like this is still relevant. It doesn't matter if the first time you got pregnant, you didn't think or didn't know about this stuff. But I think that's really an important point about, you know, it's not just, oh, just start taking your prenatal three months before you get pregnant, because that's in the best case scenario that you already got all your pre- your nutrient needs stabilized. And this is just like, you know, the cherry on top to prepare. So that's, I'm guessing that would be a big reason why a year in advance gives your body plenty of time to get up to speed with being fully repleted in nutrients. And then you're not like fixing a deficiency while that egg is forming. Absolutely. And I love that you brought up the like second or third pregnancy. I recommend that if there's going to be a next pregnancy that you just don't stop taking the prenatal. You absolutely need it through pregnancy and postpartum, whether you're breastfeeding or not, but especially if you're breastfeeding, you need to keep those repleted. But I actually have a lot of women come to me who are struggling with secondary infertility. You know, they had, they got pregnant fine the first time, but then the next second or third time it's not happening. And I think a lot of it is because pregnancy and breastfeeding depletes our bodies so much that it makes it harder to get pregnant the next time around. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't realize that until a family member of mine actually struggled with it, the secondary, which secondary infertility, for those of you who don't know, is as Anna said, you get pregnant the first time relatively easily, right? Like I think it's like what it takes you less than like six months is considered relatively easily to get pregnant. Um, But then the second time or the third time or whenever post that first pregnancy attempt and you're then not getting pregnant. I think you can correct me if I'm wrong because I don't know what the uh, clinical definition of secondary infertility is, but I know infertility is usually diagnosed when somebody has been trying for a year unsuccessfully. Is that the same with secondary as well? That's a good question. Do you happen to know? Because it also varies by age, right? So if you're geriatrics and your listeners can't see me, but I'm using quotes with geriatrics. That That's me. I'm, I'm, listed, as, <laughs> I'm listed as high risk because I'm turning 35 two months before my due date. So right, right. they really need to change the terminology around that advanced maternal age. But I think that if you're over 35, the point being that it's six months is what they would then start doing, you know, and I don't know, I may, somebody may correct me if I'm wrong about this. I don't know that there is a clear definition for secondary infertility in terms of how many months you've been trying. Infertility in and of itself, I find to be a complete misnomer, right? Like at what point are you, I mean, I prefer the term subfertility, right? Because just because you're not pregnant one month doesn't mean you're not ever going to get pregnant again in subsequent months. And infertility makes it sound like it's a lifelong diagnosis, which it's really not. There's so much that you can do to improve that your fertility that I, and yeah, the term secondary infertility, it's, it should be something more that implies like not pregnant yet, not something implying you can't get pregnant. Mm-hmm. So just to kind of wrap up with some practical tips for people, because as I mentioned, I can nerd out on this stuff all day and being pregnant myself, like it's 
I'm obviously, well, I shouldn't say, shouldn't say obviously, but I'm thinking about this stuff a lot more now than I was a year ago because, you know, I wasn't necessarily in it myself. But I love to provide some kind of practical stuff that people can do if they are struggling to get pregnant. So we'll put Anna's prenatal guide in the show notes that you guys can download if you want to check that out and just go through what she has to share about picking the right prenatal and making sure that whichever one you're taking is the right one. And hopefully, you know, by now, if you want to get pregnant in the next six to 12 months, you should go ahead and start, start a <laughs> good one. Preform vitamin A. Yep. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, um, other than getting on a good quality prenatal, like yesterday, basically, what are other steps that someone should take if they either want to get pregnant in the near future or have struggled to get pregnant. Yeah. Well, you've mentioned, brought this up a few times about the fertility awareness method. So a lot of women who come to me are really using, just relying on an app to help them figure out when they're fertile, when they're ovulating. And I do a lot of educating with clients about how to, you know, the body literacy and how, you you know, how to test your cervical mucus and get really comfy with what's going on down there so that you're not relying on an app and instead can really tell from your own body signal. So getting the timing, right. I, you wouldn't believe how many people aren't actually getting the timing, right. Um, and just to pause you there, the timing as many of you listeners probably know, but not everybody, this is not taught to girls growing up. Women are only fertile six days out of the month, correct? And that's- At most, yeah. Yeah, six would Depending be like- Depending on how healthy the sperm are. So like right, four to right. six days, yeah. Yeah, so six six would be if your husband or, or partner is like, you know, their sperm are super strong swimmers and can survive for six days. I mean, it's- So have you read the book by Lisa Hendrickson Jack called- yeah. um The Fifth Final Sign. Yes, The Fifth Final Sign. Oh my gosh, yeah. that was so interesting. I learned so much really interesting stuff about- human physiology. And there's so many things about like how the cervical mucus and stuff actually like keeps the sperm alive and how it like right. is designed to help how them it, swim like, faster. Pulls the sperm up and in. Is that crazy? I yeah. know it's so crazy. It's, and it's funny because then when you learn all this stuff, you realize like, oh, if I am not producing cervical mucus, like even if I was ovulating, if I'm not producing cervical mucus very well, like that could be a reason why we're not getting pregnant because the sperm are just not getting to where they need to go. So I love that book. You guys should all check that out. We'll put that in the show notes if you haven't read that one. But um, Lisa was a guest on our show a while back and I got to have her back on because she's brilliant. But that was something that, you know, those apps, like, yeah, you can like kind of track things, but if you're not paying attention to that, it's like, how do you know you're even you know, creating a conducive environment for the conception process. And just because it happened last month doesn't mean it's going to like, you know, if you ovulate on day, say 14 last month, doesn't mean you're going to ovulate on day 14 again the next month. So that's why you can't just rely on that app. You have to be able to tell you, you know, like you said, if your cycles are irregular and you're going 60 days between cycles, especially then you can't rely on what happened last cycle to predict what will happen this cycle. Yeah. Well, and even um, my, like, I know for me, my cycles tended to be more around like 32 to 34 days on average, which some women are like, oh my gosh, that's so bad. It's not regular, but it is regular as long as it's less than 35. But my ovulatory day would usually be like 17 or 18, which totally makes sense based on the length of my cycle. But like, if I thought, oh, it's day 14, and then I was, you know, having sex on day 11 or something, it's like that might have been too long to actually like have the conception happen. So it's one reason I'm sure you know why why people need to know their own bodies and not just think, oh, this is what the four, day 14 is when, you know, everybody ovulates and that's when I have to make sure I'm, you know, having sex on that day. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So, okay, let's see. Let's go back to your original question, which was like, if people are struggling, what tips do I give? So getting the timing right you know, maybe like just to focus on nutrition, one of the first steps that I work on with women is balancing their blood sugar. So we talked a lot at the beginning about not making, making sure you're not going too low in carb, right? You need that for your ovarian health, but also your adrenal health, your thyroid health, your mood. Um, but with those carbohydrates, it's really important to be about, you know, choosing complex fiberful versions 
and pairing those with fat and protein. So for women who are struggling, I find that they're often going too far to the extreme where they're like eating just vegetables and not getting carb and protein with that. Um, or they're eating just something like oatmeal for breakfast, which is all carb and not getting enough fat and protein with it. So working on balancing your macronutrients to make sure you've got balanced blood sugar actually goes a really long way for improving fertility. It helps with the insulin sig signaling in your ovaries and just helps, you know, get the whole reproductive hormone balance, like a strong foundation so that the hormones can be balanced. So blood sugar balance is one that thrown around a lot, but really is important. I also, I, you know, can't emphasize enough how important it is to get the guy involved or the sperm donor, right? Like the, it takes two to tango and sperm health is a big piece of the equation here. So for couples that are struggling, you know, I think it's important to get the sperm evaluated and also get the guy getting some good antioxidants in some selenium, some zinc, you know, making sure that you're in it together, not just from a physical health standpoint, but from an emotional and mental health standpoint. It, I, it frustrates me that I think it's unfair that it's often the burden of the fertility is so much of it is placed on women and not sh more shared in within the couple. Yeah. Well, and a lot of people don't know that 50% of inf or fertility issues are actually because of the man's health or the man's situation. So I totally agree with that, that a lot of, I mean, we're, we're primarily talking to women. And I think for women, you could maybe say that the balance tips a little heavier in their direction because, you know, after conception, it is hundred percent, the woman's body that's doing all the work. So just getting pregnant, like once you're pregnant, the man's not super involved as I've, <laughs> as I've discovered over the last four months, I'm the one that's dealing with all of it. And my husband's just being very sweet and, you know, doing what he can, but it's, he can't, he can't take on any of the the work from me. So, but I will say that from a uh, fertility struggle perspective, I think a lot of times the women are the ones that are getting like all the focus and it's, that's definitely not appropriate. Any other final words of wisdom for people who are? Oh, for people who are struggling. Um, I think my final word would just be don't take unexplained infertility as an explanation. You know, I am often just flabbergasted and so frustrated of the women who will come to me who've been told they have unexplained infertility and the next step that they're given is IUI or IVF. And there's, you know, to me, when I do an assessment, it's obvious that they have endometriosis or PCOS or just that they're not eating a balanced diet, you know? So I find that almost always, unless it's an anatomical issue, there is an explanation and it just takes digging a little bit further. Um, I've recently started doing Dutch hormone testing where we look not just at the levels of the hormones of, you know, your reproductive hormones. Cause if you go to the doctor, they'll test your FSH, your LH, your AMH, your estradiol, which is your estrogen, you know, and, and with this Dutch test, you can go much more in depth and look at your metabolism and your liver function and your adrenal function. So I'm going off there, but I, just to say that your fertility is a byproduct of your overall health. And that includes your mental, emotional health, your digestive health, your adrenal health. And so if a you know conventional doctor tells you you have unexplained infertility and all that they've looked at is your ovaries, you're not getting a full picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I feel like, as I mentioned, I think this was on the record. I mentioned this, that my mom works primarily with fertility clients and I guess she's partnered kind of with a local fertility clinic that's a little bit more like up and up as far as paying attention to that kind of stuff is concerned. That's why they are working with her. But I swear my mom's goal is to like put fertility clinics out of business because it's like most conventional fertility clinics, it's like they just go straight to the medical treatment. And and we're, and I'm certainly not saying this, and I don't think Anna's saying this either. Like we're not saying don't use medicine because there is a lot of circumstances where that's very helpful. But to just go straight into that without any sort of exploration as to like, okay, what what could be contributing to this from a you know baseline health perspective? I just I really do not understand it. I hope that it's not just because of the the money that can be made from fertility treatments, but. Um, it really, to me, makes no sense. Yeah, if you look at the statistics, so the researchers at Harvard School of Public Health have published a ton of papers and a book called The Fertility Diet. And they found when you're looking at ovulatory infertility, so again, not anatomical issues, but that with a, what they have coined their fertility diet, they can reduce 
ovulatory infertility by 66%. If you look at the data of IVF, one round of IVF for somebody who's young, under 37, the success rate is less than 40%. So what that tells me is that you have a better chance of improving your ovulatory fertility by following a healthy diet than you would with one round of IBS that cost you $20,000. And by following a fertility diet or getting your whole health picture in place, you're setting yourself up for a healthier pregnancy where you feel better, an easier recovery postpartum. You know, you're getting to the underlying cause of maybe why you're not getting pregnant and healing as opposed to, you know, IVF and IUI, as you said, absolutely have their place, but it is an expensive band-aid. It doesn't get to the root cause of the issue. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, we're going to need to wrap up because yeah. <laughs> I was, I was joking with Anna that like, when I get into something, we can talk for so long and I like to try to keep these episodes under an hour. But what I was going to say is with the IVF treatment, that's getting you pregnant in the first place. That's, there, that's not doing anything to help keep you pregnant. And sadly, I feel like a lot of women will go through those treatments and get pregnant, but then lose the baby because there was an issue that wasn't being addressed a lot of times with low progesterone, low thyroid hormone, that kind of stuff. And it's, you know, let alone the cost associated with a failed IVF attempt, like losing a baby when you were so excited to get that positive test is awful. So it's like, even if you end up going one of those, you know, medical routes, which again, I'm totally, I have no problem with people doing that, at least get to a place where you're maximizing the chances that it's actually going to stick because that's, you know, that's got to be one of the worst experiences to go through all that cost and effort and emotional roller coaster and then to not even have a baby at the end. And sadly, I think a lot of those statistics about IVF are based on the conception percentage as opposed to the actual percentage of live birth at the end. And so, you know, the, the success rate when it comes to actually having a baby might even be lower than that. So it's, um, the goal is if you're going to go through any sort of fertility treatment, the goal is to make your body as receptive as possible. And as you said, there's a lot of women out there that don't even need those drugs because with good nutrition and good lifestyle changes, they can actually get into a very fertile state. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, like I said, Anna, I could talk about this for a lot of time. And I don't get to talk about it as often anymore since I do business coaching exclusively at this point. But when I get the opportunity to to chat, I do enjoy it. So I appreciate you coming on the show yeah, and so sharing your wisdom. Thank yeah. you, Laura. And um, yeah. like I said, what we're going to do is we're going to share Anna's prenatal guide in the notes. So if you want to go to episode 123, of the Fed and Fearless podcast and go download that. I know I'm going to go download it and check it out and see what she has to say. (laughs) Um, And uh, that way you guys can make sure that whatever prenatal you're taking during or before pregnancy is the right one. Um, How else can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about working with you? Yeah, I am fertility nutritionist. So you can find me at fertility, you know, dash nutritionist.com or on Instagram at fertility nutritionist. And that's the best way to get in touch with me. Oh, I just wanted to make sure I want to double check because on our notes, we have fertility underscore nutritionist underscore as the yes. handle. Is that correct? Okay. Well, we'll yes. we'll put that in the show notes as well. I just want to make sure you get the right one because there could be one that's without those underscores and it could be a totally different person. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, you know, in Instagram now you can search pretty well. So if you just put fertility nutrition, I think I'll come up, but you're right. Underscores are key. Thank you, Laura. Yeah. Well, like I said, we'll <laughs> make sure we have the right link so you guys know exactly who you're who you're looking up and getting the person who you heard today. So, well, like I said, Anna, it's been so awesome having you on the show and getting to chat all things fertility. Thank and you. I know that yeah. there's a lot of people out there that learned some new things today about their their fertility changes and efforts and everything. And whether they have fertility challenges or not, I think this is important for all women to know. So I'm really glad that you came on the show to talk about it. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much, Laura. Yeah. Well, thanks to you guys for hanging out for another longer episode. Actually, I think the one that we're doing next week is the other one that's a little longer. So I hope you guys are enjoying these conversations. But we'll uh, we'll look forward to seeing you here next week on the Fed and Fearless podcast. And until then, I hope you stay healthy and take care of yourselves. Take care, everybody. Are you a nutritionist or dietitian struggling to figure out how much to charge for your programs and services? 
Maybe you've heard that as a nutritionist, you should just charge what you're worth. But this way of thinking can cause you to either undercharge your clients or work yourself into the ground trying to earn your worth. As a healthcare provider, you can't set up a pricing structure that forces you to sacrifice your own health and well being in the name of your business and your clients. But I promise it doesn't have to be this way. When you download my free profit planning workbook, I'll walk you step by step through the 10 step process for determining the right pricing for your nutrition business. As a nutritionist, you have the power to completely change someone's life for the better. There's huge value in that. So it's time to stop underselling what you do. By following along with this worksheet, you can determine exactly what you need to charge to achieve your revenue goals with ease. I'll teach you everything I've learned about pricing from growing my own nutrition business to over $250,000 in revenue annually and helping other dietitian and nutrition entrepreneurs hit their first 10 to $30,000 months and beyond. To get your free workbook, go to lauraschoenfeld.com forward slash profit, P-R-O-F-I-T, and grab your copy today so you no longer have to wonder how to set the right rates for your incredibly valuable nutrition services. That's lauraschoenfeld.com forward slash profit. It's time to make the money that you deserve as a nutritionist, and I can't wait to help you get there.